Today, I'm going to be looking at Dark Albion, The Rose War, by RPG Pundit. It's a setting book for old-school role-playing games set in medieval England. Mostly historically accurate, but definitely adapted with some fantastic elements that make it a better fit for the fantasy genre most people run role-playing games in. I have the hardcover version. The binding of the hardcover version is fairly solid, although I have noticed that at the very back of the book, there was an issue where we begin to see a little bit of cracking here along the spine. However, this hasn't been an issue. The pages don't feel like they're loose, so I'm not really worried about it coming apart at all. Paper quality is not terribly good. Um, it is fairly see-through. We have a bit of bleed coming through um, from one page to another. However, this was a print-on-demand book, and the quality of those, while getting better and better, is still not quite up to the quality of a full offset printing of a book. The design of the book uses a lot of public domain images. In fact, I think that's all of the art that's used. And it has a very rustic, um, very traditional feel to it. However, the wide variety of types of art used does give it a kind of eclectic feel, and it stops it from really pulling together into one artistic vision. This may bother you, it might not, but most of the art is of high quality due to being taken from professional artists over the centuries. So as I mentioned, this is set in medieval England. It's intended to be a setting for a very or a fairly realistic type of game where historical accuracy is important to the game masters and the players. There is little to no mechanics present in the book. It is almost entirely a uh, setting. This makes it very easily adaptable to even role playing games that aren't of the old school variety. There is a number of images per page for the most part, making it very illustrated. But I think it's a little debatable how helpful some of it is. We have a very detailed hex map of this version of England. And the book does focus on the different sections and zooms into the hexes, allowing this to be done as a hex crawl very easily. We have a map of London in 1453. And many of the sections or the parts of London have been numbered and are gone in through or gone through in detail in this section. The layout, while clean and easy to read, does not pay a whole lot of attention to layout in the sense of preventing page flips, which I see more and more books putting a focus on now. So there's a bit of flipping back and forth you have to do. Also, I'm not sure how much of the information is strictly helpful to running games. Uh, much of the information seems a bit excessive. It gives you more information that you need, more than you would actually use in a game. And personally, I would prefer something that focused more on the gameable aspects of this setting, rather than going through such detail um, in every aspect. Here we have a great example of a hex crawl. The hexes are uh, six miles on a side. So if nothing else, this book could be very useful for running a hex crawl of England, even if you didn't use a lot of the other stuff. It goes through the different sections of England. And while I'm sure much of this is fairly historically accurate, um, it's the sort of thing that I probably wouldn't read if I was running this game. Or I might glance at it, but most of it I would probably make up as I went. A lot of the information presented isn't terribly gameable, as I mentioned, or it doesn't have that as a focus. Uh, much of the information isn't better than what a game master could come up with on the fly. And that is the, the standard that I tend to look for in these games. Is the material they're giving me significantly better than what I could make up on my own? So we have a gazetteer of all of the different main sections of England, the different counties, 
that you can adventure in. You have the Isle of Mon, Man. You have Whales. We have a section on the kingdoms on the continent, which is medieval Europe, but with some things changed. For example, France has been taken over by a um, invasion of demonic frogs, apparently. It is now called Frogland. I mean, it's France. It's been taken over by frogs. I think there's a joke there. There are elves present, though I believe they're not usually called elves, um, and they are relegated to the margins of society. So you have a very traditional um, take on the fairy folk being driven out of the civilized world. Here we have a hex crawl of all of Europe, with each hex being 48 miles across. We have some details about the different countries you can travel to, although the details are, I feel, not enough to really run a campaign there which makes you wonder how useful they would be. And it's unlikely that your campaign is really going to leave England, seeing as that is the focus. We have some details about how law and justice works in Albion, and this sort of thing is quite useful, I think, because that's one of the procedural things that you're going to need to understand to actually make the game run. It's going to affect what the players think about and how they choose to act. We have a history of Albion here, and this is one of those sections where I worry or I question a bit why it's in the book. It could be useful for people who want a very in-depth understanding of how uh, this author has structured the history of England. And from what I understand, this is fairly close to English history, but there are changes made in it that doesn't make it strictly historically accurate. Um, and if that's the case, I wonder what the use is of it. I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not going to read a detailed history going king by king of a whole setting before I choose to run it. However, for people who want a detailed background knowledge before they run a game, then I'm sure this would be a gold mine. The game is set during the Rose War, essentially the War of the Roses. So I suppose you could use it to simply run a strictly historical campaign within that time frame. Skipping ahead through the history here. So we have characters in Albion, the different social classes, and we have a explanation of what the different social classes mean. This stuff is more gameable. This is something that you would actually need um, if you're going to correctly portray the interactions of different types of characters. prior events. We have some random tables, which are useful, although they tend to be much more ordinary than the type of crazy random tables that you get in D&D games. Random tables of names. This would certainly be useful. We have how money works. And I think he does make an attempt to make money uh, feel more historically accurate. In D&D games, the prices of different things are based more on their how valuable they are to the, the character um, in terms of usefulness in the game, whereas I think that an attempt here has been made to make it more historically accurate. Some items that are quite useful or powerful, like you know, excellent weapons, wouldn't actually cost that much. Whereas things like um, full plate mail would be so expensive that almost no one could afford it. Noble houses. Annual events. Here's some great things that you could use to shake up a campaign. Although, as I mentioned, none of them are particularly unusual or um, 
they don't really spark your imagination. They're fairly normal stuff. A, a royal visit, a scandal breaks out, there's an unpopular official, things like that. People of interest in the setting. So it goes through a lot of the important nobles and religious figures. Um, Christianity is not a thing in this world. It's been replaced by something called the Church of the Unconquered Sun, uh, which worships a Mithras-type figure. I'm not entirely sure why Christianity was replaced. I'm not sure what it adds. It does give an excuse for clerics to have um, magical powers. So I suppose that could be one reason. And this is one of those things, again, where you could use this to grab names and the coats of arms add a nice touch to it. But most of the things describing the nobles um, don't necessarily make for great fodder for adventures. It's fairly, he was born here, he, this was his daughter, this was his wife, and here's one or two things that he did. So most of this stuff could easily be made up by a game master on the fly, which makes me question its usefulness. Let's give me a head. And there are many, many, many pages devoted to this sort of thing. Sorcery and secrets. So essentials of how magic works. We have a list of magic spells, fairly similar to your typical D&D spells, but with some changes made. Rules for summoning. Rules for creating magical items. And the typical magic items used in this um, offer pluses and minuses to different abilities and give you, you know, one or two special powers, although they aren't the type of um, creative use magic items that I tend to prefer magic items that players have to think about and then use creatively to solve problems. Most of them do what you would expect they would. A page on poisons, which is unusual for a game, so that's interesting. Alchemy, and we have a section on adventuring. Encounter table, that's something that you could definitely use in any game with more details about the encounter table. Although most of these paragraphs don't add much more than a GM would normally assume to be true. Villages and towns. The random tables and events for cities, towns, and for the, the nation of Albion as a whole are, I think, the most useful thing although they could easily have been expanded, which I would have liked, and added some more interesting results. We have some tombs, some dungeons that have been pre-designed and laid out for us, although this one is fairly linear, fairly straightforward. This one's more detailed, has more branching paths, although the effort to make the world a bit more grounded um, does turn the dungeons into things like burial mounds or barrow mounds, which I think is an interesting touch. Although it may take out a bit of the excitement and weirdness that most people expect from these types of games. We have a layout of a court or for um, a tower attached to a wall. And we have some appendices. One thing I would have loved to see is more pictures like this. I understand that this was mostly public domain art, but this sort of thing is very useful. If we had a lot of pages of things like this with a lot of um, notes about what the different places meant, then this would provide great adventuring locations for people to have sessions. The way it's laid out, the perspective that is drawn from really allows you to see um, Lots of opportunities for, I could sneak in that window, I could travel through here while you travel up this um, tower and go along the roof. I love pictures like this because it sparks players' imaginations when they're thinking about ways to tackle problems. Some basic house rules. 
ways to handle combat and weapons. So there are some mechanics in here, but they are quite optional. And then we have an appendix at the end um, for Fantastic Heroes and Witchery, which is the system that this was originally made for. So that's my summary of Dark Albion, The Rose War. I would say that it would be useful for people who want a fairly detailed setting with a lot of information about characters that are already existing and walking around in the world. Um, that does give the world a sense of groundedness and realism and permanence. Um, but in my opinion, a lot of the information is not interesting enough to justify the word count. I feel like a lot of the word count feels padded or it doesn't feel like it's giving me information that I would use consistently. In any case, if you've played Dark Albion The Rose War, please let me know below and tell me what your experience was, especially when it comes to how useful the different sections of the book were to you. What parts did you use and what parts did you not use? Thanks for watching. Please let me know any other books that you would like me to review and check out my channel if you would like to subscribe up here. You can support me on Patreon over here and you can check out some more of my videos over here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys later.